Hello, this is the first in a series of recordings dealing with what we call two-level factorial designs. And this is from the notes, uh, two-level designs part one. You should read the notes before watching this video. And in this video, I'm going to introduce what we call two to the k factorials. And I'll talk a little bit about the analysis of them and talk a little bit about the issue of interactions, which is a key point for factorial experiments. Well, and I'm mostly, by the way, going to focus on using the jump software to uh, show you some of the analyses we do on these designs. Well, when we do factorial designs, that is, factorial simply means that we do all possible combinations of factors and levels. Uh, two to the k designs are among the most efficient. The exponent k stands for the number of factors, and the base 2 represents the number of levels. So a 2 squared factorial would have four treatments. A 2 to the third would have eight treatments apart from, <coughs> excuse me, apart from replication. And we're going to discuss these designs in the context of an injection molding experiment. This was a study done some year, number of years ago on an injection molding process for these small plastic parts used for printers. And the engineers decided to focus on only two factors. One was the injection nozzle temperature, and the second was a concentration of an additive added to the plastic to try to improve tensile strength. So they ran each of these two factors at two levels. Hence, this is a 2 squared factorial, a 2 to the 2. Okay. And since there are only four unique settings, they elected to replicate every trial three times. And if you look at the pattern column in the data table, you'll see every unique combination occurs three times. So what I'm going to do at this point is switch over to the jump software and talk about the analysis of this experiment. And again, two to the k designs are very popular uh, in practice because they're efficient, for one thing. And two, often if you're trying to establish potential causal relationships, all you need are two levels, you know, a low and a high level. In fact, many people who naively experiment typically have far too many levels, making the experiment far too big. So as a starting point, two levels are, t are often all that we need. So in the ex current experiment, we have temperature and additive, and we're using the generic minus 1, plus 1 to represent low and high settings, respectively. In actual practice, you'd actually substitute in the actual values used in the experiment. And you'll notice the strength column gives you the strength of the plastic parts in PSI. And as I mentioned, if you'll notice, in the pattern column, every trial has three replicates. By the way, the plus plus means both factors are at their high setting, and minus minus would indicate they're both at their low setting, and so forth. So for this type of design, there are only three possible experimental effects we can estimate. The effect of temperature, the effect of additive, and their interaction. So we want to fit a statistical model representing the relationship of strength and the two factors. So in the Analyze menu, we go to Fit Model. Okay. So in the Fit Model window, our measured response, Y, is strength. And then we highlight <coughs> in the Select Columns window our two factors. And under Macros, I'm going to select Full Factorial, which simply means it fits all uh, possible individual effects or main effects and interactions. And under emphasis, I'm going to select screening. For design of experiments, 
screening simply gives you nicer default settings but it doesn't necessarily prevent you from doing all types of analyses it's just nicer defaults for design of experiments At this point I will click run okay. and we see our um, widen things a bit here and we'll see our <coughs> report window notice the actual by predicted plot this on the y-axis are the actual measured strength values for the three replicates and on the y, that's the y-axis the x-axis is the predicted strength in other words what does our model predict okay. and again you'll notice for each predicted strength there are three values because there are three replicates so these three replicates for each of the four settings, it's against the two squared factorial, among these replicates is how we estimate experimental error. For instance, at around 20 psi, in an ideal world, all three of those trials would have led to exactly the same compressive, I'm sorry, this is tensile strength, the same tensile strength, but because of experimental error or noise, there's variation. So when we estimate our model, we want to estimate experimental error or noise. Okay. Because in order to say something has a real effect on the response, we have to show that effect is larger than noise alone. In other words, we've changed the response more than the response could have changed on its own. That's how we establish that we have a causal relationship as opposed to noise. Okay. So we have our typical ANOVA table. We've studied these significantly. Okay. Notice the eight degrees of freedom for error. Okay. That comes from uh, the three replicates at each of the four settings. So there's two degrees of freedom in each group of replicates to estimate experimental error. The mean square error is 9.67 PSI squared. That's the measured sample variance of the response. Again, mean square error is one of the most important quantities in this table and is our fundamental measure of noise or experimental error in the response. In other words, since the error occurs among replicates, there is no explanation in the design itself for that variation and then the square root of the mean square error often simply called the root mean square error is the standard deviation of the response so typical uh, uh, run to run noise or part to part noise in PSI is about three in other words, there's no explanation for it. That's just natural variation part to part in this physical system. Okay. When you come to the parameter estimates table, this is indeed our estimated model. So for this model, we have an intercept, a temperature effect, an additive effect, and temperature by uh, additive is how we estimate interactions. Interactions uh, are represented mathematically as cross products. And you should read the part one notes uh, for two level designs where we graphically explain in detail why the cross product represents an interaction. Okay, so this, as I said, represents a predictive model. And this is what is used this model okay, to generate the predictions in the actual by predicted plot. And if you'd like to save this model to the data table, okay, under the main report menu, under save columns, select prediction formula. You go to your data table, there's a new column, okay, and you see the prediction uh, uh, predictive model. It's very straightforward. These are very straightforward linear models, 
but in practice they're very powerful in terms of predicting uh, the behavior or performance of a physical system. Okay. Notice in these tables that t-tests are done. Again, you should read the notes carefully. It explains these t-tests. But basically these are one sample t-tests for the significance of each of the terms in the model. We do not really care about the test for the intercept. The model requires an intercept in order to fit correctly, so we don't worry about it. The coefficients, for instance, for temperature, the coefficient is minus 0.67, indicating as we every degree we go up in temperature, we go down 1 psi. Okay. And if we take a look at the significance tests, Notice the p-value for temperature is quite large, which might give you the impression temperature is not important. The fact of the matter is it's highly important, but notice the interaction is the biggest effect of all and has a very small p-value. So basically what this is telling you is temperature and additive are both important, but their most important effect is how they interact. So we have something we call the heredity principle. So if a higher order term, like an interaction, is significant, then we keep the lower order terms comprising that interaction in the model. So I would not remove temperature from this model. Now another uh, nice feature of the jump software, and you're going to, we're going to see a lot of this going forward, is the prediction profiler. The prediction profiler is a visual display, it's dynamic and interactive, of the model that you see fit in the parameter estimates table. So what you can do, you can click and drag the factor settings around, okay. and to the left it gives you the predicted response and the slope of the lines tell you the direction and relative magnitude of the effect of each of the factors. So I'm going to start by essentially putting them both at about zero. Okay. Notice temperature, and this is where one can be fooled has a flat line. It means the slope is essentially zero, meaning it looks like temperature doesn't have any effect. But as I said, be careful. This is highly misleading. So what I'm going to do is click and drag additive to its low temperature. Notice when additive is at its low temperature, I uh, see additive is at its low level. I should have said temperature has a positive effect. If I put additive at its high level, temperature has a negative effect. Hence, on average, it looks like temperature doesn't have a big effect, but it really does. Okay. So if I put, again, concentration at around zero, it looks like there's no temperature effect but if I go to low concentration, temperature has a positive effect. If I go to high concentration, temperature has a negative effect. This behavior, by the way, is very common. This is not an unusual scenario. And again, is the reason we discourage one factor at a time experimentation, because those designs cannot capture interactions. Well, also under the main report menu to the left of the response uh, header at the top. Factor profiling are a series of graphical displays and here you can get interaction plots and I'll just focus on the top interaction plot and notice uh, in this plot the x-axis is additive and the two lines are for temperature and to the right is the measured strength. So notice 
that when temperature has a high setting, additive has a negative effect. It goes down. Okay? If temperature is at its low setting, additive goes up. And the reason I point this out, notice that there are the plot is symmetric. So in the lower left-hand corner, temperature is on the x-axis, and the lines plot for concentration. The point is an interaction of temperature and additive is symmetric in that it doesn't matter if we say additive by temperature or temperature by additive. The effect is the same. And then finally, one other graphical display that I like, or actually a couple. One is the contour profiler. And in the contour profiler, in that report menu, I would select contour grid. Okay, and this gives you a top-down topographic map of what the response surface looks like. And then finally, if we can get it here, the factor profiling surface plot gives you a nice 3D view. So there's a 3D view of the response surface, and it looks a bit like a saddle. In fact, we often just call it a saddle system. And that saddle shape comes from the interaction, which warps the response surface. Okay. In other words, uh, I've actually highlighted, let's see if I can blow up the points for you a little bit. I've added the data and notice that that interaction across product term is actually needed in order for the model to actually fit the data. Okay, so what would happen if there were no interactions? So I'm going to show you a modified version of the data and we've modified it in that we've intentionally removed the interaction to show you what a response surface would look like without the interaction. So again, I go to Analyze, Fit Model. Again, Strength is our response. So I highlight my two factors in the Select Columns window. Under Macros, I hit Full Factorial. And Emphasis, again, I'll use Screening. This time, notice in the parameter estimates table, the t-test for the cross product is almost, well, virtually zero with a p-value of one, meaning there's no real interaction effect. Okay. In fact, we mathematically removed it. And I'm actually going to go up to the effect summary and remove the interaction. So this time, notice that no matter where in the profiler I put additive concentration, notice carefully the slope of temperature doesn't change, okay? and vice versa. If I change temperature, the slope of additive is unaffected because they do not interact. Okay? And then if I use my profiler display, okay, so I'll show first the, let's see, the contour profiler, okay. contour grid. And notice this time there's no curvature. It's just a flat plane. And we can really see this in the surface plot. Okay. So there's our surface plot on the left without an interaction. Again, let me blow up the points a little bit for you. Okay. So on your left is what the response surface would look like without an interaction. Notice it's just a flat plane. And then on the right, notice what it looks like with an interaction. So what we'll see going forward is one of the things that an interaction does, it warps a response surface and tends to put ridges in them. We often say they look like saddles. Okay. So on the right is typically what a system would look like with an interaction, and on the left, 
what a system would look like without an interaction. And that concludes this video.